Slashaholics, welcome to another episode of Out of Print Slashers. I am Sean Campbell. I am joined today by the 80 Slasher Librarian, Josh LaRue. How are you doing today? Doing good, Sean. Uh, it's a very special episode today. That's right. And we have a special guest today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm me. And my name is Matt Costello. And I'm a, a novelist, a game writer, and television writer, and... Uh, I cooked some pretty good dishes, and I also wrote the novels Child's Play 2, Child's Play 3. Um, there were tie-in books with the second and third movie, and I've loved being, having a connection with Child's Play. So enjoy talking with you and about the little guy. <laughs> so my, my, my first introduction to Chucky was... I remember, I remember talking with you a long time ago, Josh. I found this VHS in a store. It, it was some video store. It wasn't even Blockbuster or something. It was called Boogeyman, the killer compilation. Oh. And they showed a five-minute clip of Candyman, Chucky, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street. And that really got me into horror. The five-minute clip they showed of Chucky was when he's locked in the closet in the school and he kills the teacher. Okay. Um. So this reading this book, you know... Reading the second one hit me harder just because that was my first introduction, even mm. though, you know, I only saw the five minute clip, then I went back and watched one, two, three. Um, but I really enjoyed reading these. And yeah, I gotta say my my favorite part of these books was getting all the backstory for Charles Lee Ray. What, what do you what do you think, Josh? Uh, it, for sure. Like the backstory was great because that's something the movie all you really got was him, you know, mm. running into the toy store. And I think we, you know, in the later movies, you got a little glimpse of the past, like in uh, Curse of Chucky. Um, but yeah, the books, some of that, some of the stuff they're doing now was kind of brought up in the books, you know, like uh, possessing multiple dolls and the, and the like mm-hmm. like that. That was a, really enjoyed that. Uh, I was going to ask, uh, my first question really is, how, how did this gig come about and was part one ever offered, or was that because it was tied up in a different film company at the time? Or yeah, so um, I was uh, see, I began writing uh, horror fiction. I wrote basically I wrote games and role playing games, oh, okay. like uh, Call of Cthulhu, perhaps something called Dungeons and Dragons, and I, I did that. I did game reviews, um, but eventually I, uh, sold my first novel, horror novel, and then. The second and third and fourth novels went to a company called Berkeley Putnam, a real substantial pub, uh, publisher. And my editor was the famous Ginger Buchanan, who's edited many horror writers. Um, and so I was I was there and I was writing my own personal horror novels. And she said, would you like to think about doing the novelization for Child's Play 2? I never did a novelization. Uh, I read them as a kid. I loved them as a kid. Uh, for me, it was an extension of the film world. And I said, well, I write novels. Should I write a novelization? Uh, so that's what came about. And I did number two. And then when number three came, same question, same answer. And I did the third one. And I had a blast because the thing about it is a film script's about 110, 120 pages. That's actually kind of on a little bit on the long side. So that's what you get to see in a movie. A novel's like 350, 375, 400 pages. So you get the opportunity to go a lot deeper. And actually, if you're writing a novelization, you have to go deeper because you have more pages to fill. Um, and that was fine because, you know, one thing that film, and stop me if any of this gets me like, what is he barreling on about? Oh, I love it. Uh, it's like <laughs> uh, one of one of the things about film is, and difference between film and books is, is a book you can go inside a character's head. So if you read the, the child's play books, you know um, whoever's the point of view character at a particular scene, you're in their head. You only experience you know what's going on inside their head. Um, that's something that cannot happen in the film. Yeah. You can see them. You get a facial expression. You can might imagine. But books open that whole inner world, the doubts, the concerns. Should I do this? Should I try that? What's going to happen there? Um, so so a, scene, a scene that was a page 
in the script could be much longer when you do that deep dive once you've picked who the point of view character is. And the film film kind of sticks with, like if it's on Chucky, you're going to see Chucky's point of view. If you're on the other characters, um, whose names I obviously forget, but like, you know, you're going to see it from their, their point of view. Um, so it's wonderful doing that. And then the opportunity to go into part of the story that is not covered by the film. That was great. That was great. Were there guidelines that they gave you uh, as far as like your own creative input? Like, can't do this, you can do this, or did you pretty much have No, to I mean, considering that, you know, uh, um, so I think you asked about Child's Play 1, right? Why is it oh, Child's yes. Play 1? Yeah, that was part yes. of the question. That was part B of the section, or question or C. Um, so I don't think they, anyone expected Child's Play to be the hit it was. And then, so to do a movie tie-in book after the movie's been out, and this is like early, I don't know where this is in the VHS days, but yeah. it might be early on. So we've got novelizations for two, novelizations for three, um, but not one. And it was never discussed, but I've had, I've had people actually publishers say to me, we do that book now because oh. they they think it would sell um it hasn't happened i think i guess universal controls because it was a universal control of the franchise at that yeah. point i'm not sure what their involvement is now so guidelines no the guidelines was you know it was like uh learn learn on the job you know here's the script and it was i guess pretty much a final script i couldn't be sure because i saw the movie later it seemed to be pretty close to final so you get the script and um there's no uh I, there may be such a book like how to do novelizations 101 yeah. step one <laughs> <laughs> learn how to write <laughs> that's that sort of thing so um there was no restrictions but for me doing the horror the type of horror i've done and i don't do as much horror these days but except in games i did a big horror game that came out this year probably the biggest um but then the horror fiction has been a little bit less so um was i need to know what's going on in other words you know i i i have writer friends who it suffices to say there's evil that's all we need to know mm -mm. what's what's the mythos what's happening what's conspiring so that led to the whole backstory with um Charles Lee Ray. And then once, and so there was no, no guidance to not do that. Okay. Uh, and I did that. And I came up with a couple of things about that backstory that I absolutely really loved. And there was never, and, and then later I, I heard from somewhere, this is pre Twitter, obviously, and all, all that jazz, that Don was happy with it too. Okay. So that's, that's interesting stuff. So I did hear that, but the two things that stuck out to me in these, um, I know, I know, I was going to think about maybe going through two and then going through three, but because they kind of fall one after the other, um, mm -hmm. the two things that stuck out to me most of all were in the set that you you get to see both Charles Lee Ray, uh, different parts of his backstory, and two, it was mainly about his mother, um, about how short she was, how he was bullied, and he ended up killing her, and that was his first kill. That stuck out to me, and then in three you actually get to see Dambala. You, like, yeah. And then I was I was rereading that, and I think I wrote down what it was. It was like a soup bowl of eyes that he saw out of the gray mist. And I'm like, I, I don't want to be a part of any of what any of that is. Um, yeah, um, I thought you were going to repeat the forbidden phrase that oh. is said, which would be a big mistake. You repeat that. that Are they we're, doing all, we're all, <laughs> yes, that's right. Something like that. It's pretty close right there. Yeah, but definitely well, had whole, some uh, like Cthulhu esque um, right. visualizations there. Right. Well, number two, like you know, where where does someone like Charles E. Ray, wonderful person that he is, where does he come from? And also thinking ironically, how does he become? You know, how tall is Chucky? Twenty half feet? I don't know. He's right. Yeah. yeah. So how does he become that? So I don't know where 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 do ideas come from? You know, um, Ray Bradbury says. Um, 
they asked him where he got his ideas from. He says, well, I got, I got the heart of a little boy. I keep it right in my desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think Stephen King work. once repeated, Stephen King eventually said the same thing too. Um, so I got, and it just seemed, of course, he grew up with his mother who was just, you know, she was, she was height challenged, let's say. She was a little person and she was just horrible to him. And then there comes the moment. So his first person he killed, you know, happens to be his mother, which is significant. Um, makes him makes him worse than uh, Tony Perkins and Psycho. And the other thing is, it's a little person. And then the whole irony that that night that the movie begins, and the movie doesn't get into this at all, yeah. what he ends up becoming, you know, mystically and magically entrapped in this little animated person. It's a karmic justice, really. Like exactly. A, I mean, I mean, only it's a big deal about it. I said, that's pretty, pretty cool. It you is. Know, um, so that, that was the focus for number two. Uh, number three was, well, what's that magical universe? Because there was, a, again, breathing room. Number three has the military background, the military school background, you know, and the factory and all that. So what's actually, so then you go to, I was a big Cthulhu fan. I did uh, a call of Cthulhu. Where is it? Should be here somewhere. Mm -hmm. Shame with self-promotion. It's a solitaire module. It's pretty thick, too. It's probably one of the biggest solitaire modules ever done for Call of Cthulhu. So I, I love Lovecraft, love Cthulhu. And my own early horror fiction was um, a lot of eyeballs, tentacles, <laughs> you name it. You know, the, the thing that cannot be described because it's so shudderingly horrible. You only, you only uh, get little glimpses of it in the book. You never get the full picture. So I would imagine right. if, you know, if there was a, if you had done a fourth one, we would have gotten like another little glimpse, but like never the whole picture. Right, right. And it, it, enough, for me, it was, I guess the goal was to make it enough of the myth that I understood the, mag the rules of that magical universe. And again, some writers would say, that's not important. To me, you know, even in a Cthuloid world, now the real the great thing about zombies is there's rules of zombies. Though there's different rules depending on which movie you see. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you got to get them in the head. Sometimes you don't. You know, it's, it's, it depends whose rules you're. <laughs> right, you know, and sometimes they don't move quickly. Sometimes they do. Um, but to have have a system that kind of made sense, and, and probably in this third the Charles Play Three, I didn't get too deep into it, but I'm sure I have notebooks. I don't have them anymore that have mad scrollings of, you know, pentagrams and don't, you know, of everything that what I thought the myth was. So that was fun too. But different, they each had a different focus in terms of what part of the backstory they're going to focus on. Yeah. One was, one was personal, the other is myth or legend, right? You know, I'm kind of jumping ahead a lot, like, because we can, we can go anywhere we want with this discussion. I'm just jumping ahead because we're talking about this. Another type of karmic justice scene that I really love that a lot of my uh, subscribers kind of disagree with because they're more about how the actual movie played out, uh, the ending of part three. I love the fact that in your novelization for part three, it is him doing the uh, incantation that ends up getting him defeated because the lightning from the storm actually strikes the ride he's on, you know, so he actually does himself in. Right. And uh, I really, I really like that. I thought that would have been really, that would have been better in the movie than him falling into the fan and everything. You know, I really, yeah. Right. And I, I, I think I remember the script did have him falling in the fan, you know, um, the, the shit hits the fan, so to speak. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm not sure if the script actually had some of the stuff that you're talking about there with, with the ride and the incantation. Um, I don't have the script anymore. Well, actually, I probably do. Buried in the Indiana Jones style warehouse <laughs> somewhere around here. Um, but yeah, I mean that that probably sounds to me pretty fitting, and that's what I'd be thinking. Like, you want the evil has to sort of become undone to some extent by its own doing. Yeah, um, like you I, know, it's right. Yeah, I thought 
I thought maybe Dombala, you know, I know this is probably going deeper than you ever intended or whatever, mm -hmm. but like in my mind, it I almost felt like maybe Dombala was done with Charles Lee Ray. You know, you almost like a punishment for not, you know, doing enough worship or something or whatever the power and that lightning bolt wasn't as accidental as it seemed. That was just me diving too deep, probably. But uh, well, you know, I mean, like it's interesting you say that because I, I mean, obviously, cannot remember what was in my head. But to me, that would make sense that he was carried away with his own abilities and powers that was given to him by basically an evil god, you know, an anti-god. And you know, if he, if you don't sort of pay proper respect to the powers that feed you, yeah. Well, well, that also throws back to uh, movie one where it was, you know, you perverted everything I've taught you. So that was right. just the last straw. Right. Um, right. And then even even considering how that branches off of even the beginning of Child's Play 3, I mean, the beginning of the book and the movie are very different. Uh, the, factory, because, the factory scene with the dolls being made, yeah. Mm -hmm. With the rat. Because in the yeah, movie, yeah. you know, it was just like a drop of blood into a vat. But this one, it was... You know, the rat, you know, spoiler alert yeah. for anyone who hasn't seen the movie or read the book uh, a little late, but... 40 years. Um, why, are they, why are they watching this video? <laughs> I think at this point, we just kind of stop with the spoilers yeah. at this point. Um, but, yeah, with the rat chewing into Chucky and then the blood seeping into the sewer and going into the pipe that went straight into a particular doll. So I thought that was right. really interesting. It might explain, like, a little bit of, like, the animalistic tendency of him... In right. this movie, being a little more aggressive, not just at the end of his rope mentally, spiritually, but at the same time, almost like physically. So that was right, interesting right. for his characterization in this. Uh, yeah. And I know that one of the problems with the movie is that they were rushed. But in this book, you took so much time and right. dedication to craft yeah. it so mm -hmm. well with the characterizations. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up, I enjoyed the book a lot more than I enjoyed the movie. Me mm -hmm. too. Yeah, right. uh, well, that's an incredible thing to hear. And actually, I, I've, I've seen people post similar things. Like I was looking maybe on the website, your website, and other places with people commenting. Um, I mean, if you're a book person, you're going to always get more out of the book. There's just no way around that. But the thing is, so you think about the rat, you know, the, you know people always say, write what you know. Bought this house, a little town of Katona, had a beautiful stream on it. It's a hundred year old house. Who knows how many people died there, right? I'm from Brooklyn, you know, so I, what do I know from the country? And all of a sudden, I'm seeing wires being cut. I'm thinking, what the, what's going on here, you know? Initially, I suspected that the cleaning person was on some sort of bizarre rampage cutting my speaker wires. <laughs> this is before Bluetooth, mind you. <laughs> um, and um, then I was looking for something. I leaned down. And I saw underneath the radiator, scat, pellets. And I said, oh, what is that? And then I discovered we had something in the house called rats. And I got an education as to what rats can do, how rats are. And I think I've written about rats easily. I've used them in books three or four times because they're insane. They're yeah. just... They can't see for shit. <laughs> they, they they chew through everything. They they they're constantly there's you know constant estrus. They're constantly reproducing, making baby rats. It's they can eat anything, and then if you kill one, it's in your walls forever. It's so I'm pretty sure that rat. That's you know why I had the rat there with the factory and the blood. Well, also said, oh, yeah. if you. I'm sorry, I did not mean to interrupt. I'm no, sorry, I, I'm just rambling on. That's all. <laughs> I was going to say first, uh, the only two positive rats in fiction I can think of is Ratatouille and Splinter from Ninja Turtles. <laughs> and oh, right. uh, then, I, then I was going to say, uh, but your angle with the rat and the blood going into one particular doll mm -hmm. uh, cleared up something that bugged me about part three. Because way before the multiple doll thing in Cult of Chucky, I was thinking, wouldn't that get his blood and stuff into multiple dolls? you know, right. in the vat, and wouldn't we have multiple Chuckies running around? So right. when you, when I saw that, I just assumed that that was what the uh, early scripts said. But to mm -hmm. hear that that was from you makes it even better. Because right. um, that makes right. so much more sense, so much more right. sense. And by the way, I should preface that by saying, 
uh, this is like being a political person on trial. To the best of my recollection, that's where I'd say the, that rat came from. But it could be also when, because I was a horror novelist, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't making a living writing novelizations. So for me, I would have to know, like the same question you had, if that was in the script, I'd say, well, there's disconnect there. There's something that doesn't, doesn't really kind of work. Yeah. Um, and I would have thought, well, what's a way to make it work? And again, they didn't tell me, don't do this, don't do that. As long as you stuck to the larger parameters of the story. So, yeah, it does resolve that question, though. Because there'd be, yeah. a, blood would be in a lot of dolls. Yeah. You know, it, bunch of, and bunch and, of and other toys. Other toys, sure. too, other than just, I think I made a joke uh, with Sean. We actually brought this point up because we did a discussion of these two books really early on this mm -hmm. series of uh, podcasts. And yeah. I brought up, I think I brought up a joke, like the plastic would have been made to make other things and pardon my yeah. French here, but I was like, God <laughs> damn it, Andy, I'm stuck in a helicopter. You know? <laughs> right. Or a He-Man he -Man toy or like Stretch Armstrong, one of those old, you know, guys like that or G.I. Joe and, you know, or you know, Barbie. Even a, a Barbie, that'd be, hmm, that'd be interesting. Chucky meets Barbie. That'd pretty much be the movie Small Soldiers at that point. Right. Oh, right. Small exactly. Soldiers, yeah. Soldiers. Let's see. Trying to look through my notes and see if I made any other points. Well, I know that we talked about um, we talked about his past and everything, killing his mm -hmm. mom, and uh, I also really enjoyed the dynamic. Uh, you actually wrote the step the uh, uh, foster father. Uh, I think the movie was trying to play it too safe, you know, with his mm -hmm. anger and everything, because you really made it more so in the book, and it made it, oh, it made it more fitting. It's almost like Chucky did a service, you know, uh, dispatching right. dispatching the foster father. And, uh, and that's kind of a little bit of, I mean, let's face it, Chucky's a tough cookie, you know, yeah. he's, 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 you know, he'll kill the blink, but, but you still want. Whether you start from Frankenstein, you know the cla maybe classic car novel, um, to the version with Karloff, you almost want the monster, the person who the monster destroys, kind of like it fits. It kind of you know, and that the force of father pushing that envelope with the force of father did that. You yeah, know? no one's gonna cry any tears because that guy's gone. Exactly. And he's gone and hasta la vista. Now you also took a character in part three, and, and I'm going to lose my horror card-carrying member card for this, but I can't remember his name. Sean, you might be able to help me. Uh, um, the, ner the nerdy guy. Winehurst. <laughs> Winehurst, yes. You actually gave him a, uh, like, in it, we got in his head a little bit, and we knew that he was wanting to do the right thing, you right. know, and not be such a coward. So it made more sense whenever he, you know, sacrificed himself for everybody else. In the movie, he just seems like a yellow-bellied coward. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, why did he all of a sudden do that? But, yeah, you know, we appreciated that you, even with characters mm -hmm. like his, you gave us more. And he was struggling with what he saw in the barbershop, you know, getting mm -hmm. in his head about that, trying to, like, force himself not to believe what he saw. Uh, so that's another thing. You're Even the minor characters, you did such a good job of uh, fleshing them out, like, really well. And, and the thing is, that's the magic of point of view. If you get inside that character's head, any character's head, you know, you're going to know what they're going to do and not do. And in the film, all you can actually sometimes is, you know, all you can show is their behavior, what you see, what you hear. Um, the book, you're going to get that open sesame and then give a whole different palette. So when they do something, it's motivated. It's, it makes sense for who they are that they did that. And you don't get that disconnect. I think, I think film in general sometimes you go like, why did that character do that? And yeah. it's it's hard. You have sometimes you know, I think you can have a conversation like a tete a tete, and and that reveals something about who the character is, um, and then that's helpful. But the the magic of being in their minds, you see the interplay, the debate, the concern, the fear, and then they take action. But you see where all that came from is. Yes, gold. That's that's gold and stuff. And just to give credit where credit's due, when I was starting out, um, 
I got a call from a writer who was also published by my publisher, was friends with my publisher, my editor. Um, my editor wanted him to blurb the book. You know what a blurb is? That's you say, this is the best book ever. Oh, yeah. This, yeah. This is a book meant to be read or something. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> this book has pages. You should see it. So This is definitely gonna, a book. <laughs> this is a book. Take my word for it. <laughs> it has a cover and everything else. Um, and it's a call from Harlan Ellison. Oh, wow. And he, says, and he said, and was, he spent about an hour with me. He says, look, kid, I'm not going to blurb the book. And I did, you know, I, I got the book, I, I read it, you know, and a lot of things there, there but I want to, there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about. And then I got a private lesson on point of view from Harlan Ellison wow. that I never forgot. I, I never forgot. And my writing, I mean, I was sort of like on the cusp there, but you drift in out. And I see a lot, of, I've, I've worked, you know, I've seen other writers and you can see how it is. They're in the head, but they're not. Then they're another character. And who said, am I in now? And where, is that the writer saying that? Is the writer <laughs> at the cocktail party too? You know, it's like, whose point of view is that? And so after he spoke to me, so I, Harlan um, is an amazing figure, but for me, he's, you know, he's, he did, that was that was wonderful to have that time. For him to That's the highest uh, honor right there to hear from him. He was, so. he was, he was great. Well, he, he he was a writer, capital W. Sean, did you have a did you have a note pulled up? Yes. Um, so one thing I liked, and I know you pointed it out, Josh, um, a while back. Um, but when when Child's Play one happened, it was you know he's trying to get his soul into Andy so he can be uh, human again. But it's in right. book it's in book two that it's actually said that they're going to switch. So Andy's going to be in the doll. Yes. And that was mentioned in two, but in three, Chucky was actually trying to play it to where if he got in Tyler's body and Tyler was in the doll, Andy would kill the doll and that would that would tie up some loose ends. So it, it built on that concept mm -hmm. uh, that I think that would have been interesting if it had gone along that direction. Yeah, right. the movies never did that. Was that was that all you on that where it's like a double transfer and not just the one-way trip? Um, Again, I mean... I'm going to have to go on. Frankly, Your Honor, I don't recall. I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't at the crime scene. Um, so my guess would be, just because I know how I write now, I think I'm always going to be looking for what's the mechanical logic there. So in book two, it says, "Okay, Andy and I can swap." That's that's a, that. Book three, it gets a little more complicated. You know, there's a couple of moving pieces, and. Um, so my guess would be I'd have to figure out what what really would what what is Charles Lee Ray trying to really pull off here? What what's what's the, what's the win for him to get out of the freaking doll and have the doll destroyed so he doesn't have this maniac you know doll coming from that now not him. Yeah. So I would think that would just be you know novel writing you know a novel writing basic figure out what's going on and what the character wants to do how they're going to do it. How is so so important, at least when it comes to novels? Um, I mean, people can s slough off, you know, how do you, how do you break into a house? But if you slow it down and take your time, and you're moment by moment saying, what are the decisions, what are the things you're looking at? I'm just so glad like getting into a house that's not yours. Not that I advise doing that, boys and girls. Uh, <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right in the bottom, we are not advocating anybody breaking into people's homes. But if you do that, all of a sudden, it's phenomenally interesting and suspenseful to do that. Um, so long-winded answers say, where that came from, I don't know, but my, it sounds more like just novel writer. And the other, oh, the other thing I should say, this kind of relates to that. These books were never just work for me. Yeah. N none of the books actually... And I've done, I don't know how many books that are connected to licensed properties. For example, I did the two Doom 3 novels. I did um, I did Rage based on Id's game Rage. I did the King Kong prequel for Peter Jackson. I did a Poltergeist yeah. novel. Um, and there's probably some I'm forgetting. They were always as, and this, you know, call me crazy, they were as valuable to me as 
um, my own work, you know? Just knows yeah. my earbud's been sticking out like a unicorn oh. for a while there. <laughs> Thanks for not telling me, guys. <laughs> it's all Sean's fault. Yeah, thank you, though. I'm ready for my beam up now. I, know. I spent 20% of my time trying to decipher every book on that shelf. That's just oh, that, that yeah. part of my brain that's just like distracted by all oh, the back here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. This is a, not, not a lot of them, but you know. Um, yep, there's a ton. There's a ton. And like, uh, you know, and early on, you know, I, I started doing games. Yeah. This this is gonna date me. It's gonna to date your listeners, but you know, I wrote this game. Oh my gosh, yes, yeah. yes. I was wanting to read that book. I gotta get a I gotta get uh well, this, of that this, to this is not the novel, this is the player's guy, which has my script in it. Okay. Script, it has this which okay. is cool. Yeah, I love um, the seventh guest, uh eleventh hour, um, and I just got really great. Uh, I got I downloaded the I bought the thirteenth doll, the fan sequel. Oh yeah. I haven't got to play it yet, but I heard it's uh, really good, but yeah, yeah. they're they're they did they really did a nice job in that apparently. Oh, and also there's a there's, there's a VR seventh guest that I think it's VR seventh guest just came out. Oh wow. Um, okay. See I'm gonna have um, to go guys. <laughs> and but uh yeah. And just in February I mentioned this game, so I did I did the um the script writing, story writing um for uh Resident Evil Four. Oh wow! For, you know, so that was, and that was a big franchise to work with. Yeah, and that's... Um, cool game too. Turned out really well. Um, well, if you ever want to... oh, sorry, I was just oh. going to say, if anybody ever wants to have an an old angry man ghost uh, make fun of you for not beating him in puzzles, you got to try the seventh guest in eleventh hour. It is it, kidding. It's a lot of fun. Great puzzles. The horror element is is great. I did not know that you were connected to the actual script. I thought you wrote the novelization, but that's amazing. That is that is one of my earliest uh, memories of playing PC gaming. Was the oh yeah, so. I mean I would go. I do. I speak around the world for various things, and I've had people in other countries, you know, because, who talk about being in the basement that were twelve years old and playing Seventh Guest, which tested the limits of most computers back then. Yeah, it was early CD. You know, you, it was one of the, like long of Mist. Which is the other big CD-ROM that came around at the same time? You need to have a pretty powerful computer. Um, but yeah, that was. And they contacted me because I was a horror novelist. They were in, based in Oregon. They're going to do a CD-ROM. CD-ROMs didn't exist. Yeah. So this is like you know, and there's going to be 30 frames per second full motion video. No one ever did that. In fact, people said, "You're not going to be able to do it. Not going to do it." Um, they came to me as a horror writer to do the story. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I also do games. I've written role-playing games. I did a whole book on puzzles. I called The Greatest Puzzle of All Time. So that was like, I've done like three or four peak projects that are like, for me, insanely fantastic that I just love doing. That's that awesome. was one. Yeah, it was great. That was great. Yeah, that 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 game has a special place in my heart because that was like the first PC gaming thing. That is so awesome to find out. I was. Uh, I think you can get it on. I think you can get it on your iPhone and iPad now too. So yeah, I got them all three for Steam. Um, oh, good. As well, you know, for the computer. Uh, for a while there, the only way to play the games was to have a older Windows ninety eight uh, or ninety five. Right. PC and mm -hmm. you know there were patches and stuff but they didn't always work. I remember having yeah. to play through the whole game three times of the eleventh hour just to get all the endings. But uh, right, yeah, that was <laughs> mu that was a much more complex endeavor. Yeah, that, that was a different kind of project. I mean, I, again, I did the script and story, um, but it was a more complex proposition in various ways. It was as fun, one can imagine. But to, when you replayed Seventh Guest. Did you find you were as fond of it as when you first played it? Was it? Would you say, oh, it hasn't aged too well? What was your reaction to it? Oh no, I mean, it. I'm I'm very a very nostalgic person, so okay. most things age well for me. And I I, uh -huh. I got a little more frustrated as an adult, <laughs> you know, when okay. I wasn't when I wasn't getting it right because I you know my patience right. is a little bit lower. But uh, it was it was still just as fun, you know. And, and playing on Steam, it wasn't choppy like when I tried it with a patch. Uh, years right. before, so 
Did you play it through the end? You played all uh, the way to the room at the top? Not yet, not yet. Uh, okay, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a work in progress. It gets but I'm, really, I'm really progress. tough. Those <laughs> yeah. last two or three puzzles are... Oh, man, be... I've got a game hmm. from 11th Hour, the final game. Uh, where you're yeah. trying to take all, get the more, get more of the circles or whatever, and uh, all right, I practice. I'm practicing that on my on a standalone game for when I get back into that because uh, yeah. I want to get all the endings again. So yeah, cool, yeah. cool to talk about that too. I like that, <laughs> I love it. Um, I was going to ask you uh, real quick. I, I'm not trying to like jump back into Chucky, but like no, you, uh, it's a Chucky I, interview, so please do. <laughs> I was loving the seventh guests and stuff. Talk. We're gonna have to talk about that sometime. Um, yeah. Voodoo. Did you do any like voodoo research uh, going into writing the novelizations, or do you remember? Yeah. Um, as I recall, I mean, everything, any myth, like Cthulhu mythos, I kn knew. Voodoo, I didn't really know except from like, you know, Val Luton's movies. I walk with the zombie and various other zombie um you know incarnations and voodoo incarnations um so i probably did get books out on voodoo to try to you know these you know it wasn't a mythos i knew as well as cthulhu which you know me, me and the elder guards are like this you know we're really close <laughs> really tight um so i I'm, I'm i'm pretty sure i probably would have done that um I have had people, both in books and occasionally in, in a game, say, "Where where'd you get those words from? Those those you know, or the, some deity I've manufactured." And I'd say, "It's fiction. I made the <laughs> words up. Those aren't real words, you know." And or this, there's no there's no demon, or there is. I don't personally know that demon. I haven't met a no. <laughs> haven't and I personally don't want to based on what I've seen him do. <laughs> didn't uh Sean, didn't you mention before about how it, the novelizations about villain like the CEO guy from the good guys company, how he like brought out more of that guy being a villain than the movies did? Yeah, I just um it's a testament to the great characterization in these books that you actually, mm -hmm. you know, feel more for certain characters and then other characters you want them to die more. Um, right. <laughs> so that, that that was that was a great part well of reading these. Yeah, you want them to die more horribly if possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean in the movie yeah. that one guy in the he wasn't in the limbo, but he was transporting the doll in part right. two. But he just went on chapter after chapter, and I'm just he just got worse and worse yeah, as a right. person as mm. time went on. And then he smashed Chucky's hand to get the blood flowing, so that also kind of jump started his uh, mm. desperation to get Andy. So even that characterization right there also sped yeah. the process up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So even that was great to add in. Yeah, yeah, and and again, you if you're going to have a character, you want to use the character, so take that character and run with it and film i mean what is it? how long it's, i don't know how long the movie is i'm guessing 90 20, minutes maybe 89 90 minutes so that that means it's a 90 page script more or less so then really it can't do that sort of thing where you know quadruple pages you can just take it and run with the character and push it and and then it's fun then the character takes over then he's, you know, not even writing him anymore. Just letting that character go until he's going to die. <laughs> Speaking then, of letting the character go, we, um, uh -huh. so we reviewed a couple different novelizations of books. And one of the strangest novelizations was Friday the 13th, part three. There were two novelizations based on two very different scripts. I mean, one of them, Jason was hiding behind a curtain and he was like laughing as he saw people and, and at one part, he was kind of like had racist thoughts towards yeah. certain people that were coming into the barn, mm. and it, it was just really bizarre the way they did that character. I just remember thinking when I read these novelizations, oh. I felt like it was very in tune with the movie, um, mm -hmm. so I wasn't disappointed there um, because sometimes. Can I, people... a, can I ask a question about those? I mean, they did two novelizations of the same movie. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What they did is they did one to tie in with Friday the Thirteenth Three, but the uh -huh. script changed. The script changed a lot as they were like getting ready to film. 
So the yeah. novelization was written, you know, six months before the movie was even released. Sure, that's but, right. Uh, yeah. So some, some stuff got changed. Like Jason doesn't even have the hockey mask in the book. He's wearing the clear mask that Shelley tries to scare mm -hmm. people in. Um, and then a couple years later, when they hired Simon Hawk to write um, Friday the 13th, mm -hmm. 6, they had him retro, go back retro, and he wrote uh, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, oh, so they nice. Did, so, so, well, yeah. did, so they weren't contemporaneous. He, that was done at, when he was doing 6. Yeah. And said, okay, we're going to bring these earlier books. We're going to do new versions of them. Essentially make them follow the canon, the real story. Right? That's as the story goes, yes, sir. Well, the Michael Avalon version, it is it, like the, the ending is completely different than the one in the movie. Um, I, mean, I, can, I can tell you, unless you don't want me to spoil it, if you're ever going to read it. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, it. Jason is very dead at the end of the Michael yeah. Avalon one. Not only is he very dead, there's a lot of gaslighting that goes on for the cops trying to cover up things and make people pretend they weren't even there and it, wow. it there's like this complete cover-up conspiracy going on about the murders and uh -huh. it was just i i don't i don't know if they changed the ending because it didn't test well or something but it was just mm -hmm. a very different ending my wow. suspicion is i'd always heard that it was supposed to be the final friday the 13th so i think the early script had had the decapitation like we're talking about and I think while they were shooting and they decided they were going to make more, they switched the mm -hmm. decapitation into her just putting the axe in his head, you know, and making it seem like, you know, he was dead, even though he wasn't. But like cutting his head off, I think, was the original plan. Uh, right. And that's what was in the original. Well, split. that would have had symmetry with the, the first one with his mom getting decapitated. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. So. But that's yeah, we really, yeah. yeah, we appreciate what you did with these <laughs> characters. Uh Right, right. Well, I mean, the other thing is, you know, because I talk, I like to talk about the things that the books do that are in the film, but also the scripts are good. So I, I you know, the, I enjoy the films too. So you know, for it's like the doctor's oath: first, do no harm. You know, treat the, the script well, use what's there well, and so I think that's very important. And then where those windows are to open up dive in, have fun, and, and go with that, and then use all the, you know, whatever you have as a novelist to make them fly. So it's so it's good stuff. I'd really, you know, talking about this, funny, because I, I think I told you I did the interview for the documentary to come about a year ago. They spoke to me, you know, for a good length of time. It would really be fun to do a novelization of the first movie. That would really, I don't know if that could ever happen, because it's like, you know, ancient history at this point, but. There's a fan fiction one in the works. Uh, oh, really? Oh, okay. Fan sites. Yeah, he's he's talked to me about it and kind of wow. let me sneak peek it. But, you know, it's it's a fan novelization. It would, it would be right. neat to have you brought in officially, you know, to that way. Because yeah. the original tr Chucky fans, and I don't know about you, but this is how I am too. Uh, Child's Play 1, 2, and 3, and not just because they move studios or whatever. But mm -hmm. that's like a trilogy to me, you know, a it complete yeah. trilogy. Yeah. And then you get the self-contained unit, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you could you could stop at part three, kind of like Jason fans could stop at part four if they if they right. enjoyed the human Jason more than the zombie Jason. Right. Because uh, then, so, yeah. then the whole thing changed. I mean, changes in so many ways after those first three movies. Yet Chucky's still Chucky, but you know, so many things change. Um, but I think you know, from my perspective, with if a novelization was done of book one, I'd love to think about some of the things that happened in book one, the characters in that book, um, and the introduction, and the, you know, those early stuff that happens there. That'd be great to do that in prose. To yeah, suspicion, that. suspicion mm -hmm. of Andy being the one that killed the babysitter, you know, stuff right. like that. Right, because... almost like a little bad seed thing going on there. Yeah. It's like, is Andy potentially capable of that? Um, so writing wise, that would be fun to play with. Well, so, doesn't, doesn't this take place in Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know why. I had a random thought of it would be interesting as far as the timeline because you know how that homeless person gives the mom Chucky. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, like, because of the timeline, it would be interesting if, since Halloween also took place in Illinois, if one of the inmates that Michael freed 
ended up in Chicago in that alley and then saw the cursed doll and just passed it on. Like that would be like a fun throwback. I don't know. I don't know how the logistics of that would work, but I don't know. I, I randomly just saw that when we were talking. Yeah. I mean, that probably would have studios going, which dude when worlds who's, collide. Who's, you know? who's suing who? Like, it'll be like the Halloween. This per there was like a Halloween story where someone sued down. someone, someone sued someone else, uh, and then someone countersued to make up for the money they lost suing someone else. Yeah. So it was just this ugly circle. So yeah, yeah probably. Not but it's best. an e I, it's not quite an Easter egg, but kind of like an Easter egg to have that happen would be very cool. It'd be a lot of fun. Uh, it would be. Uh, cool. I know. I know that we. I asked you this at the very beginning before we were recording. Uh -huh. But ask you again. Uh, your personal experience with this franchise, and mm -hmm. uh, if if you're still a fan of this franchise. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've watched the TV series with great admiration. Um, sporadically, because I was raising kids. I don't, know if, I don't know if either of you have kids, but when you have little kids, teenagers. Kids, <laughs> kids, oh, real oh, good. Well, you're over the hump then, at least. But yeah. like when they're little, like it was hard for me to get my own books done yeah. when you're raising raising kids, and that's a beautiful thing to do. But so the rest of the Chucky franchise, you know, Bright and Chucky and stuff, I saw another, you know, so I lost contact. But when the TV series came, went right right to that, and. Um, and what I was, oh, so here's the thing that's really amazing to me. Those books, like, I, I have, I was telling someone I have, like, five, five or six child's play two books. They say, you have five or six of them? Where'd you oh, get them? Because that's what they do with writers. They send you usually, like, ten. Um, and I must have given some away yet. That it's a character that it's still fresh. Chucky, you know, there's no, and and that's a great, that's a great myth. And I love the fact that Chucky is still that potent relevant. fictional character. I mean, yeah, relevant and unforgettable. And you can't, it's hard to go to somewhere to someone who doesn't know who the hell Chucky is. Exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I think my son, one of my sons gave me this. Last Christmas, oh, there we go, sorry. That's awesome. That's all Chucky Magnet. I don't know who made it. I don't know. It's not probably not licensed. I don't think. Um, but you know, Chucky lives. Chucky lives, and my connection, which is, I was going to say, the book probably. Do you have the date when the first book came out? Ninety, ninety-one. Yeah, it'd be around that time. Yeah. So it's something about like thirty-two, thirty-three years ago. It's a long time. Uh, <laughs> Chuck, and Chucky's been in my life, so it's it's been fun. And uh, as I said, I always treat. As I said, it was never just same level of attention I give to one of my novels. I'm going to bring. I brought to that. Same thing for the King Kong book, well, which you haven't read. If you like King Kong, yeah, I want to read, read it now. You should <laughs> read the prequel. That sounds like yeah, a lot I, of things. I, 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 I right. didn't hear the. Hmm? Oh, I was just saying, I'm really interested in the origins and the backstory of, of all that. So definitely want to so, read that. So I, I had meetings, regular meetings with Weta, and uh, Weta being the special effects place in New Zealand, and Philip Boyens was on those meetings, screenwriter. Uh, and one uh, meeting, I talked some people there, and um, I said, "Do you know?" I said, do you know why there's a large primate and, and dinosaurs on the same <laughs> island? I said, do you know? And they're building everything. They're just doing amazing stuff. And they did the book, The World of Kong. And, and um, I think the answer was more or less, and again, to the best of my recollection, they didn't. And I said, I think I have an idea. And so that kind of became the foundation for the prequel, which um, has lots of fun stuff. It also explains why Fay Ray, or you know, um, what's her character's name, oh. became Naomi Watts. Um, Carl Denham, but I mean, what was what was her name and, as a character? King Kong. And it explains explains why she has a tremendous connection to Kong. This almost empathy for this giant beast. Prequel. Well, the same thing I put in the Chucky book. Why that? 
why is she she should be scared beyond belief by this gorilla really? and yet she has emotional connection to it read the prequel and find out i'm gonna do it I'm, well speaking about yeah. chucky i have kind of a far off question i think when they were doing all those versus movies they wanted to do freddy versus jason alien versus predator whenever i heard about chucky they always wanted to put him up against leprechaun i'm like just because they're the same height is that the only <laughs> qualifications about putting these two together that is so incredibly random right. but I, right. I think that would it's, still be a really fun movie that would be good warwick davis and, and brad Dourif. Yeah. well i see chucky setting traps like home alone because the leprechaun can yeah. actually do magic but Charles right. Lee Ray would probably be good with the Saw-esque traps. So I, you know, I think that idea has been floating around. That's because that that it has legs. I mean, they have little legs, but that idea <laughs> has legs. So like, because uh, that makes perfect sense. But you're right. I mean, Chucky go against anybody. Look look what he does with humans. He'd, he'd do fine. Um, but the magic, that kind of magic versus the dark voodoo magic in a different kind of way. Yeah. You know, well, that'd be interesting if, if Chucky learned how to tap into that to fight Leprechaun. Like, that ooh. would be almost like Dembella was trying to raise, like, e equalize right. the playing field. Well, yeah. I'll tell you this much. The reason he's so yeah. relevant uh, still is you can't keep a good guy down. So, uh, <laughs> I, yeah. Heidi ho, Heidi <laughs> ho, you know, you certainly can. Okay, gentlemen, if you have no more questions, but if you do, you can always uh, return and I'll barrel on some more about Chucky. Oh, man, we, uh, we really appreciate you coming on to this channel. This was a very interesting discussion that I think is going to make a lot of people really happy to watch. Great. Great. I had a blast. Any, any, question, any questions that come you know, in the chain, you know, I can, I'll, I'll try to check in and see what people ask and if they have certain things they want to ask to the yeah, best yeah. of my ability. Yeah, anybody anybody um, watching, if you got a question, drop it down below. Uh, it'd be a lot of fun yep. to discuss it. Yeah. Um, but this has been great fun for me. I'm glad you both were there. You both could be here for so that super getting schedules uh, squared away. And um, here's to Chucky. All right. Thank you so much, sir. Um, be yep. excellent to each other, everybody. And always remember the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Matt. It was a pleasure meeting you. I'm excited right, about thanks, the seventh Sean. guest stuff, uh, knowing that you wrote that completely. And I'm going to check out that prequel. Uh, cool. Thank you, Sean. Right, thank you, Sean. All right, everyone. Make sure to read or listen to Child's Play 2 and 3. And just remember, if this one doesn't scare you, you're already dead. <laughs> nice.
friends On that you can depend But you never know There still might be a sequel C-A-U-C-K Why don't you come out and play? Listen up, fool, I'll tell you why Cause Chuck is bad and it ain't no luck Chucky, baby, here.